<laughs> Welcome back to uh, the uh, show. And uh, certainly need to talk about health. Uh, when you get up in the morning, the first thing is to check out if you're healthy. I have in the studio a former health minister under the NDC, Honorable Alexander Segwefia. Good morning. Good morning to I you. Hope you're Good doing morning great. to your viewers. Mm, thanks for joining us this morning. Let's start our conversation this week. Yeah. Let's look at the health sector, yeah. Ghana's health sector. Which state would you say the sector is in at the moment? Well, the health sector, like education, has a lot of challenges, or will always have challenges. Mm. And it's a question of uh, where your priorities lie with the various challenges that exist. Um, and we had decided that to actually get healthcare to the very person at the bottom, um, we had to put some concentration on the chip compound uh, mm. process and uh, ensure also that we had uh, sufficient uh, access to health facilities um, at the various levels. So you would see that we put in uh, quite a, a bit of uh, money into infrastructure. Uh, during the tenure of the Mills Mahama administration mm. uh, to increase the tenure of uh, health facilities up and down the country. And that was where our priority lay amongst other things that exist within uh, the health sector. Because the bottom line is that you, you need to get people, illnesses vary from the simple common malaria to vaccination of children at the birth, and then you move up to very serious illnesses. So depending on various categories. Also, we knew that with increasing the, uh, the teaching hospitals, trying to increase their numbers across the country, and that's why, for example, in the Volta region, we're upgrading uh, the, uh, whole the whole uh, regional, uh, regional hospital, hospital into a teaching hospital, mm -hmm. because we needed to get doctors to stay in the regions, and they wouldn't if they couldn't specialize. So, and you, you cannot specialize if you don't have a teaching hospital with the professors being there to actually train these uh, doctors who are up and coming. So the more teaching hospitals you create, and we wanted one per region, uh, was our, our aim, then it would mean that doctors would be happy to stay in the regions because they would be able to still specialize in the field or, or mm. that they require. Mm. So that was the focus of our uh, infrastructure, increased infrastructure uh, across board was the focus retooling uh, the existing, because we had hospitals, Colibuans, we spent a lot of money retooling it, uh, because we were, even though they, the, the buildings existed, the equipment wasn't up to date, etc. So mm. um, that was the main focus of our attention in terms of healthcare. Uh, so so the, the country. spread was from the chips to the Right up to hospitals. the tertiary, to the, up to the I, hospitals. I see. We, we have built a lot of district hospitals, a lot of uh, uh, polyclinics um, uh, across the country, as you know, in central region, in uh, Brohafu region in uh, uh, Western region, uh, and we were doing uh, a program of five or ten per region in terms of the district hospitals. The aim is to have a district hospital and then also have a regional hospital and then also eventually have a teaching hospital and then have a system where you graduate. We also had to make sure that we had personnel uh, for these hospitals. So mm -hmm. you'd see that we built, we had a lot of uh, training schools uh, up and down the country which opened in order that we could have nurses, clin clinicians, and etc. So there was a lot of work done in the health sector right. during the Mills administration. When, when you left office, yes. from where you sit and certainly you will be observing, yeah. what have you seen? Well, I think that uh, the, one of the main problems with uh, uh, the whole system of changes of government is the inability to sometimes continue things that already exist and finish them off. Um, because then politically, it's seen as a credit to your opponent and not to yourself. And so the uh, advancement or the progress of the country is totally uh, uh, slowed or slowed down mm -hmm. because of this uh, position uh, that we have in our body politic, if I can put it that way. So people then try to have a different priority or do something different, uh, which does not necessarily help. So and it, it's affecting the, the sector. It affects the whole country. Look, if you look from possibly the time of Achampong to the current government, there was between 300 to 400 
million dollars worth of uncompleted medical facilities in this country. Because when the government comes, it stops. When the government comes, it stops. So one of the priorities we will have to look at is that we have to look at all these facilities, and we started in our time, and make a decision, which ones do we have to start from scratch because they've been, the plan and everything is wrong? Which ones can we finish and put monies into this, regardless of which government started it? Because they are in areas which we can use that. And the biggest one of them all is the, uh, the maternity block mm. in Kumasi at the Konfonochi, which has been there since the, the period of uh, a huge uh, facility that we've no, you need about maybe 80, 90 million dollars, if not 100. Uh, some say 50, but depending, to actually finish that uh, edifice that stands. So there is a need for us to, as a people, begin to understand that we really have to stop this. Uh, I won't finish your work. I, 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 I'm looking at something. How do we change it? The politician will well, have to think again? Yes, and uh, you would have hoped that uh, the plan that uh, the uh, uh, GNPC, not GNPC, uh, uh, the uh, group that deals with uh, planning, our National Development Planning Commission, right. would be able to look at one plan, and even though it's for a five, seven year period, the next plan that comes should look and see how far we've gotten with things and make them priorities. But because we have manifestos, then we have to look at things and see where they go. And most of our manifestos are not that different. Uh, the way we implement things may differ, wow. but the actual uh, policy should be the same. And that is where we tend to, to but fall but down. But some would also argue that the, when, when, when a politician is in a position, then he sees what is wrong. And then you could be talking this way today, that next when you're in power, you could also say, okay, the, the government that I took over, uh, the project that the government was uh, doing, I'm not going to continue. Yes, but it depends on what type of a project. So uh, I don't say that is going to happen. But if you had a situation How where, let me explain. What type of project? If you are building a cathedral and uh, we come into office and we decide that we won't finish the church, we will rather build, finish the hospital, it makes sense. Because it's not that there's a lack of churches. There is a lack of hospitals. And the two differ. It's not like we don't have, we, we have maybe too many churches, so we are building a cathedral. Fine. I'm not saying that there's, it's a national one, there might be a reason for it. But if somebody decides that I'm not doing that, I'm going to finish a hospital, especially if it's involving government funds, I'm going to use that and continue using private funds to try and do this. Mm. Fine. But that kind of a change in priority makes sense. However, it does not necessarily make sense that you will not finish a hospital or a chip compound, or you delay the process so that, in, in effect, it doesn't appear to have been something that has been created by your predecessor. So you stall a project for two, three years, and then when it finishes, you say, well, I did it, when in actual fact, you've stalled it for two, three years. And most of these things have a financial implication mm. because we take out loans and we pay interest on those loans. They are moratorium periods. And when they pass, you still have to start paying on it. So you're, you're, you're cutting your nose to spite your face. I see. And so, and so certainly, you, you, you're not happy with uh, some of the district hospitals. I mean, they, we, we've seen w the one at Dodo Work Commission, yeah. Kumewu, uh, has been abandoned, uh, several others. You're certainly not happy about it. Well, Dodo Wa, we didn't say it. It was but the African Union uh, WHO uh, wing um, commended Dodo Wa Hospital as actually uh, a template that should be used across the whole of Africa. Uh, because of the nature of the hospital and the way it was situated and the, the administration. And I would give kudos to the doctor who was in charge of it and who has been running it for a while. He's done extremely well in terms of the administration and the way it's, it works. And the other hospitals that were supposed to have been finished, and I think there were a total of seven, mm. uh, were all going to be under the same type of issue. And we are still waiting. The, the government is talking about using drones to to um, enhance health delivery. Mm. Your view on that? I think it's a misplaced priority. Um, 
It's not that you can't do it, or it, it's just. It's, and and the reason they gave, which has to do with blood movement, uh, for me is an essential medicines according to what? Uh, well, the the bottom line is, uh, do you have the medicines in Kolibu? Let me ask a simple question. Kolibu Pharmacy is there. Because we are not paying NHI well, they can't get the, the drugs they need to actually give out in some of these hospitals. So in fact, when you go to Kolibu, you are then directed or go to a hospital, you're directed to go to a private pharmacy to buy your drugs. Now, the priority should be how can we get our government pharmacies equipped so that they can dispense NHI drugs, which are, people are entitled to without having to go and pay for it. That is for me more of a priority than a drone how do because you if the one that is even next to you you cannot deal with how do you now then get a drone if you went to uh, a hospital now and, and this is not peculiar to this government it's been there mm. and you were involved in an accident or something and you needed blood you will be asked to bring a relative to replace the, dr the, the blood you were so till you the relative came or a friend came to give blood you would not be able to get the blood they tell you that oh if it's an emergency, they'll give it to you. It's, the truth is that the reality is that the person must appear and give blood. If not, they will not give you the blood. So if you're putting blood on a drone, question, who at the other end has given blood before they give that blood and put the blood on the drone? Because that's the that is the unwritten it's policy. An unwritten policy. Yeah. Yeah, so but if, how does a drone sit, solve that problem? You're sending blood to an emergency spot. And in actual fact, they haven't got somebody to give blood already to replace it. The drone will never take off. I mean, how, and this is the reality. How do we reach hard to, <laughs> how do we get to these hard to reach areas? Well, the point is that you have to put blood banks in the right places. And that should be more of the priority. And, but the emphasis now should be uh, uh, spending some of this money on a drive to get people to donate blood voluntarily. Because we don't have enough blood in the first place. That's why you're asked to give blood, uh, replace the blood before you can take it. So we have to get a policy which we were looking at of trying to say look ministry by ministry month by month over a 12 month period you would say look we're going to the ministry of health in january all people who are eligible to give blood give blood next m ministry would be uh transport next would be the castle so that you you, you begin to build a, a mindset amongst people but start with yourselves that is government institutions and say, look, voluntarily give blood. And then, so that when you get to the point where there's enough blood, and there's a lifespan for blood, and there's enough blood in the system, and you stagger it so that as you go from one to the other, district assemblies, municipalities, uh, government institutions, make it an inherent policy that giving blood is now part and parcel. It will even point out illnesses for people that don't even know they have the illnesses. Because when they take the blood, they screen it. Mm. So for me, drones misplace priority. We have other priorities. But Moreover, we're not in any way enhance our health delivery? Look, as a country, we spend a lot of money, uh, or we get a lot of money from donors for vaccinations, HIV, etc. But this money is being reduced year in, year out now because we were now deemed to be a lower middle income economy. Mm. So, those amount, so each year, the amount we as a country have now to begin to pay for these things is going to increase. So before you take on more social interventions that cost money. Deal with the ones that you're going, you already have and are on their way. Make sure you have enough funding to cover vaccines in the next three to four years, which, because no longer will you be able to just pick them right. or get them from you donors. You have to pay for it. So we have existing debts which are coming. Some have already started, I believe. And therefore, it's imperative that these are factored into how we look at other if, uh, issues we deal with. And drones for me, therefore, it's not that it cannot work. It's a misplaced priority. Great. <coughs> now, now let, let, let's, let's shift attention a bit away from health. Mm. Now, first of all, what is happening now? A, a journalist uh, getting to uh, put out an expose about uh, a group being trained at uh, a security uh, facility, though we're told that it is no more a security facility. The... The, the government says that it is not a, a militia, but a group being uh, trained, uh, they're looking for jobs. I heard a, a very uh, 
learned. Uh, but even before you, yeah, uh, hold your thought. Let's listen to the president on on fighting uh, vigilantism. The people of Ghana do not deserve to be toyed with in such a reckless manner. The very concept of political violence is offensive and shames us all who are in politics. That is why that I'm determined that hopefully the impending dialogue between the two major political parties, the New Patriotic Party and the National Democratic Congress, who between them regularly take more than 95% of the vote in elections, who have provided all the seven governments of the Fourth Republic, and who are the only two parties currently represented in Parliament, should succeed. That's the precedent on vigilantism. Well, let's start from the, the, the castle expose. Government says they are a group looking, seeking for jobs. I think that the first thing we have to do is not to couch it in, its, in that incident alone. There are a number of incidents that have happened recently, and I think they are all connected in one shape, form, or fashion. So when you try to isolate that incident on its own, you do not understand then the gravity of what is happening in our country. I start first with the Swale incident. He's a journalist, undercover. He's assassinated. That's what happened. We had an assassination of a journalist who was part of an expose that did a lot of damage to the ruling MPP party. That's the starting point. If you do not, you want to divorce it from the other incidents, you miss the security implications of where we are in this country. So Swale's incident has a direct, if you know that armed robberies, assassination. This one was of a journalist, and I'm a criminal lawyer. When you begin to look at motive, who has a motive? Why did the police ask certain people to come for questioning? Because they look at who would have a motive for dealing, has nothing to do with the NDC. Absolutely nothing to do with the NDC in terms of motive. Others were questioned. Put that aside. You come to the second incident, Ayawasu West were gone. Here again, you have people who are armed, who on the face of what we are hearing from the commission or whatever, we do not even know whether they are legally formed under national security. Does national security even have the power to arm people to the teeth? How did they recruit them? These, some of these people may have records. What was the criteria used to give them arms after three weeks training? where they said they went there because they had intel. If their intel is as good mm. as the men they sent out there, it's not worth the paper or the salt is written on. Because here's intel that the IGP did not know about. He did not know about the operation. Night and the person, people who were in that, who should well, have known. He says it's, 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 an, it's, it's normal. Uh, Fine. Not to keep the IGP in. in, in. He... He doesn't know about it. The commander who is supposed to be in the area is not in part of the in position. People from national security, they said there's a process. In our country, when you get that type of intel, at even national security level, or even an election process, the first port of call is the police. What is not, why wouldn't the police ask to carry out this operation? And if the police are unable to order, it escalates. You always have the military on standby to back them. Mm. What national security should be having, given information. They are not supposed to have an armed group of people to go in there. And all these people in the, who we appear, we had the gentleman, he used to be a polling age, station agent uh, called Double for MPP. Once again, MPP is involved in this. The house that was attacked was the NDC person's house. Mm. So you have a situation which has created a furore and uproar in this whole country. And it has got nothing to do with NDC. Point number two. Motive for this. We are coming home to MPP. Then you come now with your question. People being trained at the castle. And some, I, I listened to, I forget his name, uh, 
listened to one of these security experts, and he made a very important point. He said, we have reached a point in our country that people should stop playing semantics, using language. It's not, there are two courts in this country. Court of law, go and play your semantics there. Court of public opinion, as far as most people on the street are concerned, this is a militia. As far as the people on the street are concerned, you can twist it any way. My own brother, Kojo Bonkruba, welcome to the club of politics. <laughs> you know, he used to, <laughs> when he was a radio presenter, uh, he, he could do, now he's in the, in the fray, real hot, uh, he's seeing it for real. And he has to be careful because his own people are not telling him that what you are putting out is wrong. So he's at straight loggerheads with his former bosses as to, and he's a journalist himself. Mm. So we have to be careful. What do they want to show that something is a militia? We've had an incident at Iowa where people have been shot. People are in hospital. So now when you put that thread running right through, this government has serious questions to answer. And the way they are going about it is wrong. Because from, I'll put Swalis on the side because that is an assassination and it's different in that regard, mm. but not with regard to motive. With regard to the I also was so gone and regard to the militia. You tell me who has resigned. Someone should resign. How uh, uh, for, for crying out loud? The commission, the president Somebody should, should find out what is the cause of look the commission's work. I have some concerns quickly about the commission. You know, if we are not careful. It can give an outlet for future prosecutions to be stifled. A crime has been committed. Whatever the commission is doing or not, why haven't we arrested somebody, regardless of what the commission is doing? Arrest people, put charges, bail them, don't give bail. They were quick to call over Swamp of In two seconds, we was to be invited. Why hasn't anybody been picked up? Why? Because the work could not. Who gave the order? There are three tiers in that matter. Those that gave the order, mm -hmm. in fact, who formed it first? That's the first point. Is it legal? Can it be done? Two, you've formed it. They've come out. Who gave the order for them to be deployed? Was the procedure? That is there. Then who, when they were shooting, who gave? Yeah, look, when you fire a weapon mm. on a range, I've been a, I was a cadet for seven years. Right. If you are given five rounds of ammunition, and you fire. If you count four shells, they can't find the fifth one. You won't leave the range that day. You must bring back all the empty shells to show that they were fired. And if you didn't fire one, then this is the live round. When you have a weapon, it comes with certain responsibilities. For seven years, I was a cadet. The amount of training I went through in that seven years on weapons, I have a healthy respect, and I know what one has to do with weapons. So please. How does a person who is on the ground, you, a, a scene, a crime scene where people are fired, the police are not even able to go, come and gather the shells. Individuals have now gathered the, the empty shells and put, everything is wrong about this operation. The commission's every, work? Every, everything about everything it is, is wrong? No, not the commission. The commission's mm. work, the reason why I can accept it at this stage, even though I don't, in principle, have a problem with it, is that had the commission not stepped in, a lot of cover-up would have taken place. Because now it has exposed a lot of the wrongs, which now have to be righted. So in that regard, it has a positive. But in regard to future prosecutions, mm. we do not want it to become a, 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 one of those. Uh, yeah, because you know, nobody at the commission was cautioned. You know, there's the caution statement. Mm. Nobody's cautioned. You come, you speak. Mm. If you're not cautioned, nothing you say can be used in evidence against you tomorrow. Okay, we're, we're wrapping up. <laughs> uh, Mr. Fusampofo's uh, comments, palatable. Yes. Well. As far as Mr. Wolf, the party is concerned, this is a doctor tape. So if that is the position of the party, then somebody should come and say, look, no, it wasn't doctored. I was there, I recorded it, or I've done this, or it was at this point. Because we know what, you are, you are into journalism, you know what these things can, what, what people can do with, with electronics. So at the moment, okay. the position is that it's a doctor tape. So I, I, there's no need for anybody to answer any questions. I'm grateful. He's a former Minister of Health under the NDC government. Grateful for your time with us thank this you morning. Too. And thanks so much for coming. Thank you too. Ms. Alex Segbefia is the name. Stay with us. Uh, the response right after here.